Support for Postcards from the Road is provided in part by MediaWorks, specialists in video imaging and graphic design. On the next Postcards from the Road, we'll travel to Madison County, where history comes alive in a museum dedicated to the dead. We'll explore the land under the ground, visit a classroom where language is seen, not heard. We'll meet a rising star who sings the blues, find out why some folks think the town is wasting away, and visit a factory that's full of baloney. That's up next on Postcards from the Road. Welcome to Madison County, Florida. I am Willie Claire Copeland, and I am happy to be your host for your visit to this special town. 50 miles east of Tallahassee is Madison County. Over 700 square miles of rolling hills with green pastures, ponds, woods, and canopied roads. It's a county with such strong ties to the past that the architecture, the atmosphere, and even some of the people seem like ghostly reminders of another century. The county seat is the town of Madison, a place that's proud of its religious foundations and family values. It's a place where people live out their lives quietly. As one generation fades, the next one arrives, but nothing really alters the pace. In the center of town, the streets are wide, shady, and lined with Victorian and antebellum homes that stand like proud monuments to their southern heritage. On the outskirts of town are reminders of another side of that heritage. Here, the homes are anything but grand. The people, however, are proud. Most are descendants of the slaves and poor farmers who worked the cotton fields in the 1800s. The town of Madison was settled by cotton planters who moved here from South Carolina in 1838. Cotton was king, as they say, and at one time the world's largest long staple cotton gin was located right here in the brick building that now houses the government offices of HRS. This was the steam engine that drove the gin. It still operates, and they fire it up at least once a year, lest the town should forget from whence it came. The cotton played a major role for many years. Uh, at the end of the uh, 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s, the boll weevil took over, and then the cotton after about 1920s began to go down. The cotton was followed by shade tobacco and later corn. Eventually, timber and cattle farming came in, helping sustain the economy through the years. Madison may be a relatively poor county, but it has a rich history. And to the residents, it's much more than just a place to live. It's a way of life. The beauty of the land surrounding Madison is obvious to even the most casual observer, but the uniqueness of the land under Madison County attracts a fearless group of explorers from all over the world. In Florida, we have what's known as the Florida Aquifer System. It is a, a thick sequence of limestones and dolostones that is widespread in the southeast, and the caves form by dissolving of the limestone. What happens is rain falling through the atmosphere becomes acidic, falls on the ground, soaks in, and then begins to dissolve the limestone when it uh, begins to flow into the limestone. Because of all the water-filled caves that we have in Florida, in this area around Madison County, northern Florida, a tremendous number of cave divers seem to flock to this area from Tennessee, Kentucky, all over Florida, all over the world, in fact. The National Association for Cave Diving had a uh, their annual convention in Madison and uh, we were able to, the people who come from all over the place are able to get a good number of dives in because within a, mile, a couple of miles 
of, of the convention site are plenty of good places to dive, including the spring right there in Madison. The uh, cave system at Madison is internationally known. It's a very, very beautiful cave system. There is a lot of people in Europe, and especially I'm dealing with uh, different dive shops in Germany, and they are very interested in places like Madison Blue Springs and the area around the Witlacuchi River. These places that we're exploring are completely dark. Uh, it, it's darker than space, and the only light that is in there is the lights that we have with us. It's just mind-boggling. Uh, when you go around a corner in a, in a new system and you shine your light on an area of, of the Earth that no one has ever seen and is, is sculpted uh, by natural forces, uh, the colors, the textures, uh, the, the scale of it sometimes is, is just amazing. The exhilaration of discovery and of seeing something that is, is a completely new part of the world that had never been discovered uh, is, is just as, as thrilling as can be. It's, it's one of the, the peak moments of life. On the one hand, you have beautiful, pristine areas underground, and at the same time, sometimes you can see human debris and garbage. Uh, we found um, uh, newspaper boxes uh, from the Orlando Sentinel and the Tallahassee Democrat. We found motorcycles, uh, toilet bowls, oil cans, beer cans, animal parts uh, from you know things that have been slaughtered and, and thrown in, and it's, it's really disappointing to have a place that is a natural feature, a spectacular natural feature. It just, uh, it's, it's thrilling to be in an environment like that. And then there's a the disappointment of seeing that there's, there's very little consideration for these spectacular natural areas. The state has no money at this time to buy those places. So the only way I see a future to protect those areas is by private investment, which we are doing. Private investment and hard work and interest by private individuals to be able to preserve those places. This building is the old 1898 sanctuary of the First Baptist Church on this complex of Madison, Florida. My daddy was a deacon here and my mama was over in the Methodist Church, so we went to the Methodist Church when we were little with Mama, and then she would come over with Daddy, and we'd cooperate with Daddy, and Daddy would go over and cooperate with Mama. So uh, I am a member of this church and have been ever since uh, my son was a little tiny fella. We're here at Dixie Packers in the heart of Madison, Florida with Alan Cherry, and he is going to lead us on a tour through this factory to find out how America's favorite food, hot dogs, are made. Ready, Alan? Ready. All right. Okay. This is our dry storage area where all of our boxes and spices and all of our dry goods are kept until we're ready to um, enter them into the production area. Okay. I had no idea what I was about to see. Would I ever eat hot dogs again? My first impression was a chilling one. In order to keep the meat fresh and everything germ-free, the entire plant is kept below 40 degrees. Okay, this is the uh, area of our receiving dock where all the fresh incoming meat is unloaded. He went on to tell me that some of the meat went straight to the grinder, which prompted the big question. So tell us, what the, you know, you hear the rumors that it's ears and snouts right. and all that stuff. Come on, give us, this, give us the truth right we here put, now. We put lean beef, uh, which is 80% lean, 20% fat, with uh, lean pork and some fat beef trimmings, which is 50-50, to mix and make our bologna and hot dogs. And that's the way we make them. Uh, what a relief. On that note, I was ready to see more. Pick, okay? The first guys skin it, the second guys defat it. And all the way down, the hands pulled apart into three or four different muscles. And at the end of the line here, you can see what comes off is the muscles we use in the boneless ham. Boneless ham, honey ham, baked ham, smoked ham, 
country ham. Ham for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We saw it all. When Alan told me that Dixie Packers manufactures 126 different products, I reminded him of our original mission. On our way to hot dog production, we passed by the working man's staple, the humblest of sandwich mates, bologna. As we approached our final destination, I thought of baseball games, cookouts, and the county fair, my favorite chili cheese dog, oozing with, uh-oh. It all starts here at the final blender, where the pre-blended meat is dumped up into the final blender. At that point, the spice for the hot dogs and the cure and the water is introduced at that time. It's blended for about five to eight minutes, and then it's dumped down into the emulsifier. The emulsifier grinds the meat into a slurry, a, a real soupy type solution, and then it's piped over into these tubs. From these tubs are rolled over, and then over to the dumper. The dumper dumps them into the hopper, and then from there, it's pumped over into the casing. Each casing is 110 feet long, and it takes about an hour for it to go from here to the other end, and it's ready to be uh, peeled and go in the package. What a sight. I was surrounded by thousands and thousands of hot dogs. After the initial shock of seeing them in their earliest stage wore off, heck, the cake doesn't look like much before it's baked, I decided to give Dixie Packers the thumbs up. The plant was clean and neat. The employees wore special garments. The smoke products were smoked with real wood in real smokers. They have a full-time food scientist checking the recipes and USDA inspectors to make sure of it all. And that's no baloney. These students are just like regular hearing students. You know, there's no difference other than your communication is through sign language. And they have just as much fun. They get just as frustrated as hearing students when they're, you know, not getting it. There is more to educating deaf than what happens in the classroom. Uh, from the time the students are out of the class until they come back in the next day, all of those um, things that happen there related to independent living are critical. At the North Florida Junior College, teaching independent living is just as important as teaching algebra, English, and science. Students in the hearing impaired program take on a double load while learning how to get utilities turned on, use a telecommunications device, and how to cope with emergencies, they also take classes. Students choose from classes specially designed for the deaf or from mainstream classes that are supplied with interpreters, note takers, and tutors but it's through a lot of extra work. It takes about twice as long with a deaf student uh, to get the same information across as a hearing student. While deaf students can learn to live independently and get along fine in college classes, there are still times when the spoken word is the only mode of communication available. For these times, the school provides American Sign Language interpreters. Anytime someone needs to go to the doctor, there's an emergency in the middle of the night, and there's a car accident, the police or the sheriff will call. We are on call for the hospitals. Uh, an interpreter will interpret any side conversations they hear. If the phone rings, you interpret that to let them know someone's talking on the phone. If um, someone is talking about how much pain they're in, you put in the expression in your voice that you see in the signs. And what is seen in signing is much more than just the word. And for anyone who thinks that sign language has any less subtlety, expression, or emotion, needs to have a conversation with Manuel Rojas. American Sign Language is the only language that was developed by and for deaf people. Uh, there are signs for everything that we have words for. There are dialects. If you go to the Northeast, the signs will vary somewhat from the South. If you go into the black community, there are black signs to match black dialect. So it's very versatile. With the skills that they learn at the hearing impaired program, deaf students gain independence, a vocational or college degree, and a sense of accomplishment. And yet, when they graduate, their biggest challenge is still in front of them. They wish hearing people wouldn't be afraid of them when they meet them. And secondly, that they would not um, associate their speech patterns when they're not clear 
with retardation. You know, don't be afraid to go up and even try what you know, you know, and ask for a sign or gesture. This is okay. You know, I think all of us want that feeling of acceptance and being part of a group. Madison, a very historical town. Is Mr. Browning one of our uh, good historians and a charter member of the historical society said it step every four feet and it was history. At a very early age, my mother recorded me in church, and uh, once I heard my voice on the tape, I knew at that point that that was what I wanted to do. I didn't know how, when, or where, but I knew at that point that that's what I wanted to do. Little did she know that just a few years later, he would continue what she had started by sneaking out on Friday and Saturday nights to sing in local and regional nightclubs. She eventually caught on to what was happening because she got smart enough to start checking my room from time to time and I would be missing. And uh, she would, uh, once I got back, she would go ahead on and strap me, you know, and uh, I would take the strapping. But there was never a strapping painful enough to keep Chuck from singing the blues. Years later, while raising a family and working eight to five, he was still at it. I was on a track out there working, and this song came to me, Love Affair. And about two weeks later, I had put the song on a tape, and I sent it to the guy that put my tracks together. And he said to me, he said, Chuck, this is a hit record. Can you sing a little bit of it? Sure. Everybody want to know why I smile. All of the time, I found no need to frown. Love Affair hit the top Not ten, he quit his day job, and got his big break. Like Since then, he has cut man. four albums, 40 singles, hey girl, and lent his talent to other artists man. like Johnny Taylor. Then he hit the European circuit, with bands like The Spinners, The Drifters, and The Four Tops. I think that was probably one of the biggest moments of my life, when I could walk out of the dressing room, walk out on the stage, and see any way from 6,000 to 20,000 people, then that gave me the feeling to know that you are a lot closer than you think. Currently, Chuck is about to release a collection of pop songs in a rap tune. His producer has asked him to stretch his repertoire, and though he's always willing to try new things, he'll never forget his first love. What do you do if you could do anything you wanted? Southern R&B. What do you sing in the shower? Southern R&B, because it's from the heart. It's from the heart. Give it up. Turn it loose. This monument is the Four Freedoms Monument. Colin Kelly, who was the first hero in World War II, Colin was born and reared in Madison County, Florida. Until recently, Madison County could best be described as a quiet, peaceful place. A place where families work the land that has been handed down through generations. The attitude is one of respect, both for nature and one's neighbor. But a change is taking place in this tiny town that threatens to destroy the peaceful atmosphere. Families are dividing, friends have stopped speaking, and signs of bitter anger are cropping up all over the county. You're either for us or against us. There's no neutral ground. The issue is whether or not to allow a hazardous waste incinerator to be built in Madison County. And the us are people on both sides of the controversy. This is the Hickstown Swamp, a 38,000-acre tract of wetland situated just west of Madison and at the heart of this controversy. 
Waste Tech Services Incorporated has bought an 830-acre parcel of land in the middle of the swamp to be the site of a hazardous waste incinerator. It will also include a landfill that will hold the ash byproduct of the incineration. Those who favor the project cite economics. Those opposed, the environment. Madison County desperately needs income, desperately needs jobs. Now we're talking about a facility that wants to burn the 61 most potent or virulent toxins known to man. We have um, uh, contracted with two different uh, consultants uh, to do risk analysis on the facility. Uh, one is basically uh, general environmental and human risk and the other company was doing a specific risk analysis pertaining to the Hickstown swamp area and uh, both of these are have proved have indicated that our facility has no potential to harm the environment or the people that live in this area. There was a study done by the city of Los Angeles called the Serial Associates study which recommended citing locally undesirable land usages in communities that were primarily rural, poor, poorly educated, low registered voters. You look for an area that has good transportation, we have good water supplies here, we have good electrical supplies here, so because we need a lot of water, we need a lot of electricity, and we have a good natural gas supply. We have four generations of cones living on this farm at this present time, and we just fear that the ash from it will come in, settle on our pastures, and completely ruin our feed. And destroy our animals. We will get a super fire department out of this deal. All the little communities throughout the county will get super fire departments. The county will get several million dollars a year in taxes. All of the equipment that's called pollution control is tax exempt. So all of the fancy expensive equipment they put in the plant that deals with uh, pollution control, all they have to do is apply for an exemption and it's tax exempt. That's Florida law. The tipping fees that, we'll, that we make off the top of this will amount to several million dollars. Depends on what you want to call it, we're going to call it a tipping fee. The 3% money can only be used for uh, county expenditures uh, that are involved in that plant. You know, it's a windfall. We should be courting these people, begging them to come, pleading with them to come on. The waste tax facility, if it operates to its lifetime, will only be 20 to 25 years. The employment that they're citing will never be generational jobs. It'll never be something a father can hand down to his son. It's a one-time shot. You take the job, you live out your term, and God hope you get benefits out of it and a pension out of it because they're leaving the residue and, and landfill behind. Assuming that we've closed the doors and left town, um, we still have to monitor the groundwater and this landfill area for 30 years after closure. These days, about the only thing the people of Madison County can agree on is the solidarity that was the town's pride is gone. Directly across the street from the Madison County Courthouse is an innocent looking little shop called T.J. Beggs & Company. Here, customers can buy fashionable men's clothing on the first floor. But what most of them don't know is that upstairs, in the attic, right above that rack of size 40 regulars, are the early remains of a business that has dealt with the dearly departed since the late 1800s. Beggs Funeral Service and Beggs and Company started in about 1886. And in 1986, our father was still living and we decided to commemorate a hundred years and by doing so we were trying to think of something to do to invite the public. Now there's a challenge. Just how does one celebrate a hundred years of burying the dead? So we decided to have a museum. We just started unpacking all these old artifacts and some things we had never seen before. We were uh, born pack rats, and we still are, I guess. It's not really how much they saved, but what they saved that makes this collection so unique. 
Everything from caskets and embalming fluid to a coffin-like box guaranteed to send a shiver down your spine. This was uh, called an ice cooler. It was used to hold uh, dead human remains uh, until the family could get together for a funeral. And um, I guess they just kept adding ice and they had a little drain in the bottom that you could drain the water out. Tommy Begg's grandfather didn't start out with the intention of building a thriving funeral business. It was just a natural outgrowth of the services he provided as proprietor of the general store. This business handled groceries, it handled clothing, um, all types of merchandise, um, and caskets. Tommy's father carried the services one step further when he became the 12th person in the state of Florida to receive an embalmer's license. He had a little satchel that he took his instruments in, and, and then he became uh, uh, widely known for his embalming, and then he was called to Live Oak and Perry and Monticello, different areas. He would jump on the train and take his little satchel and, uh, with the embalming fluid and all and, and do the embalming at home. The museum has virtually all the old tools of the trade, most of them still sitting right where they did 75 to 100 years ago almost as if the former practitioner were planning to return. This is um, the original coffin shop, and it's been in existence in this location probably since 1895. The baskets are <clears throat> were used to transport uh, dead human remains from the place of death to the funeral home. Mm -hmm. The one on top is for the blacks. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Is there any difference? No, it was just back then, it was just the way it was, you know. Huh. We had an integrated funeral home, but we had separate baskets. So you would bring them in in separate baskets, but they'd end up on the same table. Right. Isn't that strange? Mm -hmm. The business prospered and Beggs expanded, purchasing the first motorized hearse yeah, in the in state eight, of Florida. Not surprisingly, they still have it. It sits in a garage a block from the shop, shiny, black, and somewhat ominous looking. It doubled as an ambulance, providing, no doubt, very little comfort to those for whom it arrived. It looks like it's too short for a casket, but they do go in there. And this is the stop. In other words, depending on the size of the casket, this fits in. When you stop, then it doesn't come out the back. That's good. That's always good. Yeah. As odd as the Beggs Museum may seem at first, it does provide a genuine look at the history of death and life in North Florida. And it's not all serious either. Look in the mirror, man. Okay. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you're jumping off the ground. That is great. <laughs> That's what they call undertaker humor at the Beggs Museum in Madison. That's our show. Thank you for joining us on Postcards from the Road. I am Willie Claire Copeland from Madison County, Florida. Good night. Support for Postcards from the Road is provided in part by MediaWorks, specialists in video imaging and graphic design.